and welcome to Future Talk. One of the most important parts of designing smart machines is determining how humans will interact with them. How can we create a user interface that's easy to use, highly intuitive, and also very powerful? And what will the user interfaces of the future look like? My guest is Joy Mountford, internationally recognized leader in the field of user interfaces. As head of the Human Interface Group at Apple Computer in the 1990s, she played a major role in the design of their QuickTime software. She also served as Vice President of User Experience Design at Yahoo and played a similar role at other companies as well. She was the founder of the International Design Expo, which for over 20 years has helped develop the next generation of design innovators. And she's currently the global lead for interaction design for the Ford Motor Company at Ford's Palo Alto Research Center, where she works on autonomous vehicles. Across all of her jobs, she says her most useful skill has been as a technology therapist. Joyce, welcome to the program. Thank you, Marty. So tell me, what exactly is a technology therapist? Well, I think in retrospect, I looked at my job and I thought, what I'm doing is understanding technology well enough to try and explain it to people and understanding people well enough to get them to be able to use technology. So I thought it was a good description of technology therapist, fit, how to make the technology fit people and help people learn to use technology. So is it like therapy mostly for the people or mostly for the machines? Uh, for the machines always, yeah. Does it take yeah. a lot of insight into humans to develop a good user interface? Yes, in fact, when I began, um, a lot of people came from cognitive psychology background um, and some engineering design skills, but now it's much more a defined discipline of its own. So what are some of the considerations when you're designing a user interface? Well, um, we hope that we are designing for people, and that means you have to actually think about what they need, what they want, and as we all know, you can't just say to them, what do you want? And people would say they just want faster horses um, or more horses, but that would not lead to designing a, a car, right? So you can't actually say, what do you want? Because most people are pretty happy with what they've got. So you have to find clever ways of understanding what they seem to have problems with and understand their you know, pain points, as we call them, and then try and suggest and bring prototypes to them and then get them to talk openly about what might help them. Is one of the goals to be able to just sit down at a machine and just sort of guess how it works and your guesses are usually right and you don't have to read a 500-page manual? Well, um, I, if you're trying to allude to the fact that it would read your mind, that would be a wonderful thing if it could actually happen. But um, your mind wanders a lot, so I'm not sure if that would be a good idea. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things you can get from measurements such as you know, your um, heart rate, your galvanic skin response, those sorts of things that help you understand how people's emotions are playing into the thing. But I think reading your mind is a little bit too far-fetched right now. Now, the history of user interfaces is kind of interesting. In fact, you brought along a little slideshow to illustrate some of the things we're going to be discussing. So maybe we could get into that. Can we see that first uh, slide, please? Okay, so what are we looking at here? Well, I like telling stories about interfaces that we all face every day. Um, this happens to be an elevator set of buttons. And uh, I try and teach students um, how, you know, which ones of these are actually functional buttons, for example. Um, it turns out one of the three. Uh, there's a key there that's for emergency, but the two below are actually not actually functioning at all in any way. So when you proceed to this elevator, it's quite frustrating. So you put your hand around and you keep trying to press something, and it turns out that the buttons you're pressing that are closest to you are actually the ones that don't do anything at all. So there are buttons there that are not meant to do anything, and they're just there to confuse exactly. you? Exactly. I don't know. Ask the engineers. They built it that way. Okay. I, you know, anyway. That's the kind of thing that frustrates people. And if an interface is designed well, you don't notice sometimes because it doesn't have a pain point. Many of the p projects that I have to go and help are um, ones which have problems. But if you have a good interface, it shouldn't be kind of uh, something that you feel is not working. So it should act kind of the way you expect it to exactly. act, right? You shouldn't yeah. be surprised by anything it does. No, not unless it's humorous. OK, well, let's take a look at the next slide. So yes, um, 
I also do a lot of wandering around looking at things like signs because signs are in fact a form of navigation and navigation is a way that we learn to wayfind and we like to build interfaces that have signs around them. But signs also have information in them such as this one here which uh, is on El Camino Real in Mountain View next to my house. And one day after many years of this sign being there, my son turned to me in the car and he said, Mommy, what's a psychic cleaner? And I realized that I had absolutely no, re I had not been reading this sign for decades. I think getting your psyche clean for $2.50 would be a real bargain. I do too. I would, I would pay $5 yeah. for that. <laughs> I'd, pay, I'd, I'd probably pay more, actually. But the problem was I had just never seen it because you become blind to problems or blind to signs and you don't see what's actually in front of you. So I like to look at things like this as anomalous signage, if you like, to make people aware of what's difficult for people. So people might see things from different angles. So when you design a user interface, you have to consider that not everyone who uses it sees things as you do. They might look at right. it different angles. Right, especially if you come from a different culture or a different language, because if you're in fact a non-English, let's say, speaking, and you look at this, you'd probably actually read it as a psychic cleaner. Um, anyway, and there are other ones like that all over the place. They're quite amusing. Okay, let's look at the next slide. So this is a very classic design um, from a person called Dreyfus um, in Honeywell. It's a thermostat. It is, and it's round. Now, thermostats didn't used to be round, and of course, as you know, our hand fits very nicely into something like that. You can use your wrist to turn it very easily. Um, the design cycle that this took to get into product was about eight years long. And one would say, well, how come it takes so long? It used to be very much more like a thermostat, uh, in like a temperature thermometer. Sorry, not a thermostat, a, th a thermometer. But it took a long time to change a d design mindset to go from vertical to a round thing that you turn. So I like to say to people that designs take a long time to change people's mind and also to get into production to be a product at the end. Is that because if something is working in a satisfactory way, people see no need to change it? That's true. They also, people adapt to the way things are, and they learn bad tips, bad tra traits, and they don't see it necessary. And you know, what's it worth? Is it really that difficult to use? Is it that problematic? So they won't necessarily change things. Well, the reason for changing things might be if you're adding more features. Mm -hmm. But if you change things too often, and every time a person tries to use it, hey, it doesn't work the way it used to, what's wrong? Yeah, that's always a great one. More features is always m much better for everyone, right? Wrong. It's l really frustrating to have more and more and more features that you don't use. How many products do we know that just have lots and lots of features that you don't use? Um, and why do we keep having to buy new products with more features? And we don't really use 99% of the features that and are shipped. Why, why do you pay for 500 yeah. channels on cable TV when you watch only five of them? Correct. I completely agree. Okay, let's, right. see, let's see the next slide, please. So when I first went to Honeywell as my first job, I then realized that I had to start working on things like the space shuttle. So very quickly I moved from a very difficult, very simple one switch to hundreds, thousands of switches with all sorts of combinations, which were you know, mind-blowingly difficult to try and design. So those were, these were really challenging. Now this looks really complicated. Yes. Not only yeah. is the dashboard and the floor covered, but they had to put the overflow yeah. on the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, and they the... actually climb over the keyboard with their fingers. They have little hooks on them so the astronauts will go all over them. So it sort of sounds like maybe the user interface was kind of an afterthought on this. Like <laughs> in most modern systems, the interface is the first thing you design, and then you design the back end afterwards. But this looks like, well, they designed uh, the main stuff first, and then the UI was a little bit of an afterthought. Well, the other thing you notice here is there's lots and lots of different subsystems, and each one of them has a screen. And then the question is, is how do we connect them all together? Because some of these ex experiences need to be integrated, and they're not. But this is a very classic example of what's repeated in software now well, as do well. You have, do you have to consider who you're designing the UI for? Designing a UI for the mass market, yeah. people who have no particular technical skills and just want it to work, is different than designing it for a tiny handful of really highly trained test pilots. Yeah. Uh, yes. Who love fiddling with little bites. It's kind of a different audience. Yes, absolutely. Completely agree with you. But how did the uh, astronauts like this? Did they say, why don't you make it a little simpler next time? Well, um, yes, but they have to do a hundred million things. And they're, as it were, 
they do experiments up there, they have to fly, they have to have redundant systems, they have to do all sorts of things simultaneously. And I guess and if you press the wrong button by accident, maybe that would not be so good? Well, there's, they're very redundant, and there's a lot of guys up there checking a lot of times. Okay. So. Well, let's take a look at the next slide. So uh, I think this is quite an interesting trend now where everyone's talking about data visualization. And my life changed a lot around this time when I saw this particular visualization. So um, this map of America is actually drawn by real-time uh, images of planes flying across America, which is actually um, each image is a plane going across America uh, in a 24-hour cycle. And it makes a very beautiful, actually, piece of art. Um, and it actually was acquired by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. But I looked at it as a, a way that you can say you didn't even know that you might be on those planes, but you were part of a very big piece of artwork. And yet it was telling you what information about the actual airlines, how long the flights were, where they were going. And you could present this in a big graph or a big table or something, which would be quite boring to look at and really not very engaging. So, this is much more. So having good visuals makes it uh, easier to comprehend what you're looking at. Right, and that's, I think, where the mastery of design comes from is whether you are particularly good at visual design because we all look at most displays and controls as well. Okay, can we see the next slide please? So that looks like the earth. It is the earth, you're absolutely right. And what we have projected on top of this is a, is a touch table, multi-touch table, so that people who are using the touch table can actually press in a location with their fingers. Remember we talk about look and feel except very rarely do we actually talk about feel. We only talk mostly about visuals. So a lot of growth now is in feel. So when you touch in a particular location, it shows a, a feed directly of a live flicker feed of photos of people uploading photos from that actual location. And people particularly enjoyed this because they could actually turn the, the world around, as it were, at their fingertips, and then also see where people were doing feeds of photographs from particular countries. So having an interface where you just tap on some part of the world, you can program that to show anything you wanted, right? You could show photos that people have taken of that area, yep. but any other statistics yep. or you know, demographic trends, economic trends, uh, agricultural trends. Yes, yes, weather. Yeah. And predictive as well. A lot of people now are looking at weather patterns and also predictive information. So it's very helpful for people. Okay. So, can we see the next slide, please? So as I was saying, look and feel, um, we often forget things about many uh, people have sensory deprivation problems. As we get older, we lose feeling in our fingertips, etc. And this particular demonstration was done by some students that I funded from um, California College of Arts in um, uh, South San Francisco. Uh, and this student, Kate Richards, actually grew um, grass um, through uh, microfilaments, so that when you moved your hands across the grass, it actually showed, it moved the actual picture view that you were seeing of a video feed. And one of the people who particularly enjoyed this um, demonstration was a blind person. And he um, just was fascinated by the fact that he could feel, obviously being blind, he has very highly trained sensory capabilities in his fingers. He just loved playing with the grass and knowing that he could actually maneuver something without just doing key strokes or um, just um, doing braille. So this was a real, you know, quite an enlightening experience for him. Yeah. Uh, do we have any more slides? Is, was that the last one or is there one more? Um, there's another one. Oh, there it is. Which is one of my favorite um, kind of changes in the direction that people did in the uh, 99, this one, um, from Danny Rosen at NYU. Uh, he took um, a very familiar object like a mirror and made it out of wood, which sounds counterintuitive, but made it out of pixels of wood. And the, the pixels are about this big. And each one of them turns to reflect basically your kind of outline when you're standing in front of it. And as you move, you can see yourself made of wooden pixels. But it's obviously a very low res image, as it were. Obviously, wooden doesn't reflect much more than just your outline. But it is a reflective surface though, right? It's a reflective outline of your surface, of your face, and when you move, you can see 
your hand. What would that be used? Is that sort of like a game just to demonstrate, the, or is this uh, useful for something? Well, it's interesting. Most people don't really like seeing images of themselves in high res because they always see little flaws in themselves. But these lower quality res images, they don't mind at all. And they like to see themselves represented in this way. But mostly this particular one was used um, as uh, art pieces in lobbies of hotels, etc. But the thing that's also nice about this one is it has great sound. So when the wooden pixels move, they sound like ticker tapes, as in railroad stations. And people really love just listening to it and playing with it when it moved. So what do you think are the hottest areas pertaining to user interfaces right now? What kind of changes can we expect in the next few years on what types of devices? Well, let me give you an example. Uh, driverless cars are getting very popular. Now you're working for Ford now. I don't expect you to give away any trade secrets, obviously. But what are some of the challenges creating a user interface for a driverless car? How does the user or the driver or the person in the car tell the car you know, what to do? Well, that's, it's an interesting question, obviously. There's lots of angles on that. You just said the most important thing was tell. Do you actually speak to the car? And when you speak to the car, what kind of voice do you expect the car to have? Is it going to talk back to you? Are you going to call it a name? You know, is it going to be called, you know, what, Henry? Maybe. I don't know. But After Ford, right? Yeah, you got it. OK. Um, so I, I don't know if you would speak to a car. And is that the right thing to speak to? Or would you speak to some? Well, you have to tell it where you want it to go. Well, you could, but the other thing is probably you'd have other devices with you um, that would know where you'd want to go, just as your phone now tells you, you know, you're 12 minutes away from home, right? Your car would have the phone in it, probably, if it's going to take you home. So you have a phone app or maybe a built-in phone that uh, enables you to tell it. And, and how do you tell it to go to a gas station to fill up? The same way you would tell uh, Siri what to do. I mean, you can use it the same way. But I think the more interesting thing is, what are you going to do in the car now? Are you going to sit there just um, enjoying, what, looking out the window, looking at the traffic? Punching your knuckles, hoping yeah. that nothing bad happens. Right. So I think it's a lot, lot now to think about what actually mobility is going to change your life, how it's going to change that you're not going to be spending your time sitting in a car, plus the fact that there's going to be very much fewer accidents. And that's a safety thing that's so really terrific that we've been able to help. Does it have to be a way for humans to take control back, to say, well, this situation is too complicated for this computer. This needs a human to decide what to do in this unexpected you know, sinkhole just opened up in the middle of the street or, or something like that. Well, ca these cars that we're trying to build will be able to see lots of those kind of problems almost better, I would think, than people because they can see in all sorts of lighting conditions and in bad weather, et cetera, like that. But I, obviously, there's points where you do need to take control as well. And that's a very interesting question of you know, how far do you, what we call, take the person out of the loop or leave them in the loop. And you can't just suddenly hand over a steering wheel to them. Well, I've heard that some manual, uh, some driverless cars are being designed that don't even have manual controls. There is no steering wheel. There is no gas pedal. Well, that's, that might be true. I don't know. I haven't seen those. But um, you might have another way of being able to take over control. I don't know if it's just always a steering wheel. Right? There might be other ways of doing it. Now you're also very interested in something called data visualization. In other words, you tell the computer to gather some information. And then the way it presents the information to you should be in a way that's easily comprehensible. So what, what kind of progress are we making? to get the computer to give you information instead of like bar charts and dots on a graph, something that is you know, truly kind of like if you wanted to track the movement of people or the movement of money or you know, weather patterns in a way that was easily comprehensible so you can see the big picture right away. I think that's a lot of progress has been made and it's been very well used, especially in news services and um, in new, I mean, any form of communications, teaching, a lot of helpful information now. Uh, the problem is, is that also you can um, show erroneous information quite easily to things that are not quite true, and you can easily, you know, distort facts, which is true with any form of statistics too. 
But when you see a picture of things, people somehow take it much more seriously. Another area which is very interesting is virtual reality. Uh, you put on a helmet, and you're in this world, and you're interacting with this world. Is the idea to make it as natural as possible, like all your big game hunting in the jungle, and you're holding in your hand something roughly the size and you know, weight of a rifle? And Well, you know. I, I mean, in some situations, yes. People would like to play you know, real-life games that are obviously not dangerous, so they can then play out their fantasies, maybe. Um, however, the other thing is to be able to do things such as surgeries, that you won't learn how to do a surgery maybe virtually before you actually practice it. And a lot of those kind of activities or learning, uh, teaching again, things that you can't teach unless you go to a certain location or mining, those kind of things. Um, so yes, big, big progress in those areas, especially because the devices now are much cheaper and much lighter so that you don't have um, all that hardware carrying around with you. So you can go into unusual locations with it now as well. Now, I think you've also shown an interest in wearable UI, like uh, you have a yeah. watch that you can interact with or something else you wear on your wrist to track your emotions. Uh, do you think the current UIs are satisfactory for those, or do we need to improve them by an order of magnitude? Um, I, I, well, I've been very interested in wearables because I think uh, people don't like carrying bags and th devices with them. Um, but I think what's fascinating is to be able to weave them into fabric so that you now have soft interfaces and things that bend. And now we have um, optical LEDs, etc., so that you can actually have display surfaces that are foldable. Roll so, them up like exactly, uh, a scroll. Scroll, exactly. So it now needs, needs new meanings to the word scrolling. You, know, you can actually imagine it being a sort of loop. Now, if we define a user interface that defines what information you can feed to the computer, uh, is there a risk that people who design these systems might filter out certain types of input, like certain things you're not allowed to do? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So maybe you could be sort of controlled in that way. Yes, and I think that's an interesting question as to who's going to be in control of these things. Um, is it a company? Is it a government? Is it, you know, I don't know, but I think we are going to have to understand a lot more about our own data, uh, medical data, and who's allowed to get what pieces of information in, where, in what situations, and also how we're going to control those filters. Mm -hmm. Probably also, uh, are they going to be things that we buy, uh, or services that we buy to protect ourselves, and who will be the people that we buy those from too, the filters. Well, presumably the people who manufacture them, assuming we're still in a market economy, but maybe the government will regulate a lot. Maybe the government will say, there's things that are just too dangerous for you to operate without our help. Yeah. So you need us, the government, to tell you what's safe to do and what isn't. Yes, yes. And we just hope that we have good governments, right? Um, another interesting thing um, is drones. I don't know if you've done much with drones at all, but you're telling it where to go. And uh, one issue is the degree of autonomy. Uh, most drones today, it only does what you tell it to do, but they're developing drones that can make their own decisions. Mm. Um, and your control over them is very limited. Is this a bit of a disturbing trend? Especially you know, for warfare, like uh, now if you want the drone to uh, shoot at someone, the human has to give the command. They're developing them that doesn't require the human anymore. You can just do it much faster than anyone. It was, I mean, some of this stuff getting a little bit dangerous. Yes, I agree with you. I'm not, I don't know. I mean, the other thing is, who are the hackers? What are they going to be doing? Because they are the, the smartest people are often the greatest hackers, too. Now, what are some of the ways that we can put information into a machine? Like the old-fashioned method, you have a keyboard and a mouse. Now we have voice. Uh, voice is still a little bit crude. It, it can understand what you say, but it doesn't always understand what you meant. And there's a difference. Uh, it doesn't quite capture the nuances. Like, like if I ask you a question, maybe the question you hear is not what I'm really asking. And, and if you're sensitive, you'll probably figure that out. Uh, are we right. close that machines can do that, figure out the question under the question. Right. Well, I think that we're going to have very shortly models of each individual person that we can actually find out over history what 
you mean by these things that you keep saying, so that the nuance is there and the subtleties are picked up from the model of you as an individual. So it remembers everything you've ever done and gets a pattern? Basically, yeah. Should you be able to delete some of that information if you want? It's a good question. I, you know, you could edit your life, yeah. Yeah. Like has a web a uh, list of every website you've ever visited. You know, maybe you want to go back and erase a few of those. Well, I think a lot of people are talking about that lock, you know, lock, lock, lock chain. You know, that work where you can actually figure out which pieces you filter off to which piece and at which time. I, you know, there are very good ethical questions here that are very difficult to answer. Right. And is there anybody responsible for answering them? Is it the responsibility of the people who make the machines or maybe people in politics? And it's a question of like, yeah. who decides what ethics apply exactly. to any given yeah. society? And yeah. How do they get that job and how do they keep it? Right. And how can they be yes. deposed if they're not doing it well enough? Yes, you're asking very good questions and very tough questions. And it's certainly not in my um, area of expertise. Okay. <laughs> We only have about 30 seconds left. Do you think that all of this new technology is just nothing but good and it's only beneficial, or is this like a train that keeps building up speed until it's in danger of you know, jumping off the track altogether? Um, there's always dangers, but I, I believe in people, and I think people are fundamentally good, and they always find great things to do that are very creative and very beautiful. So, and I'm very optimistic that they will always do that. OK, very good. And I think this is a good time to stop. We're just about out of time. I've been speaking with Joy Mountford, a user interface expert with a vast amount of experience. I'm Marty Wasserman. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman, and we'll see you next time with another interesting show.